Well, go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I am thankful and grateful to be here with you. I'm abundantly thankful to be less sweaty this morning. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Acts chapter 20. We're going to be in verse 24. For the large part of the morning, we'll be in a couple of texts other than that as well, but that will be our main text. And, uh, you know, over the past few months, I don't think there's anyone's life that hasn't been altered in some way, in some fashion, through something that has happened over the last four months. Apparently, March was only two weeks ago. Uh, It's the longest two weeks of my life. Uh, but here we are, woke up yesterday morning, and I really didn't know what month it was when I first got up, and then I was like, oh my goodness, it's August? I couldn't believe that it was August. That means that we are we have less summer in front of us than we have behind us, I think. I don't know what to think about that. Uh, you know, and as we enter into what many of us are hoping will kind of get our lives at least to some form of normalcy, I think it's important that we kind of envision what is the gospel teaching me right now in my life? How does the gospel inform the path forward in my life? And quite frankly, I think we just need some reminders of how the gospel is working in our lives. Uh, You know, a little over a month ago, I turned 40 years old. And so when you turn 40, people start saying things like you're over the hill, very hurtful, very insensitive. Uh, But what's weird when you're a pastor is that when you turn 40, uh, at least a third of the church will actually think of you as an adult. And and so it's really good for my career to be 40 years old. Uh, Everybody my entire time, because I just figured out what I wanted to do very early in my life, and I got to doing it. Uh, And people have always said, but you're so young. And it's like, give me a minute. It's like, I'm doing the best that I can. I can only age one day at a time like everybody else does. But 40 is one of those birthdays that is kind of a, a kind of a moment in your life where you take inventory of what you're doing with your life. There are a couple of landmark birthdays in your life. You know, when you turn 10, that's double digits. So that's a big deal. When you turn 13, the word teen is in your, your age now, and so you're a teenager. When you turn 16, you can probably get a driver's license in most states. And it's that sense of freedom that if mommy gives you permission, you can go drive alone. And it's, that's a big deal. And then when you turn 18, you can buy lottery tickets and fight wars. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. When you turn 21, let's not talk about that one, but you know, 21. And then when you turn 25, you can rent a car. You know, that's a, it's a big deal. When you turn 30, you wonder where your 20s went and if you've wasted your life. And then when you turn 40, people say you're over the hill, you know, and you really do. It's one of those moments where it's like, how did I get here? I, I, I never would have envisioned I would have made it this far, but now that I have made it this far, what's that all about? And you kind of begin to ask yourselves very important questions about what you're doing with your life, what the road ahead is going to look like. And quite frankly, you start to think, how can I make the biggest impact with what I have left? Because I'm closer to an AARP card than I am a driver's license at this point. And statistics show us that no matter what your career is, you know, whether it's in business, whether it's in ministry, whether it's in fast food dining, that between the ages of 40 and 50 is really where you find your lane. It's where you get to the position where you're going to have the biggest impact possible because you have enough experience now that you're going to possibly get some big promotions or you're going to possibly get the job that you've been leading up to. But you're also at a point in life where you start to experience leadership in ways that you've never experienced it before because statistically speaking, by the age of 40, your kids are starting to get to a place where they understand English better than they used to, and they start to really notice the life that you're living in ways that they didn't didn't used to um, understand it. And where marriage is concerned, you've got a few years under your belt where you're really finally starting to get to the good stuff of marriage. Good stuff of marriage happens after year 10, all right? So if you can endure those first 10 years, that's when the good stuff starts, all right? And so, so try to make it that long because then you realize what an idiot you are and you start making better decisions. 
okay? You, you, you hopefully will become a little less selfish by year 10. But the key is that I'm at the age where I'm starting to ask myself, have I invested wisely over the past few years of my life, and how can I invest even more wisely for the years ahead so that I can have the biggest impact possible with my life? And so between now and Labor Day, my hope is that to share with you what I'm envisioning for my life, how God is working in my life, and through that, I hope that you can get some gospel reminders and maybe catch some vision of what God wants to do in your life and where God wants to take you in your life. So this entire series is going to jump off of the idea that Paul shares in Acts 20, 24, and then every week's going to flow from here. So let's just read the text. Here's what the apostle says to the church at Ephesus. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. There's really four stanzas in this text. And so I want to talk to you about just those four stanzas. And number one is the most important one that leads to every other one. The gospel is more precious than life. The gospel is more precious than life. I think that that is one of those phrases that at least if you are a follower of Jesus, so if you consider yourself a Christian and we say a phrase like the gospel is more precious than life, that's one of those nodders. It's like, mm-hmm, yes it is. But then you have to follow it with, is it? You know, do you really live the type of life where you agree with Paul not just in sentiment, not just in an academic sense where you say, well, when you consider the facts of the gospel and the facts of life, well, the gospel is more precious than life. But does your life actually reflect a lifestyle in which you reveal to everyone around you, yes, I believe the gospel is more precious than life. And a very important term that he uses in there is the term valuable, value. Every decision in your life is a values-based decision. When you choose one path over another path, when you choose one thing over another thing, when you choose one person over another person, you are making a values decision. So you have to ask yourself, is Paul saying anything about the way that I am investing my life? Now, when we think about investments, we think about 401ks, we think about IRAs. Uh, A lot of people now are uh, downloading these apps like Robinhood where you can buy and sell stocks. So I've got a group of friends now. They all think that they are Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street, and they think they're day traders. And it's like, well, I knew Spirit Airlines was going to skyrocket. I'm just a genius. I've made 32 cents this week. I'm going to buy that yacht. It's like, no, you're not a tycoon (laughs) ding-a-ling. Couldn't find your way out of a wet paper bag. But the, the key is that Paul is making a statement about the way that you value your life. Now, to help you understand, the apostle at this point is with the church at Ephesus. It's a church that he planted with leaders that he discipled, with pastors that he appointed. And the apostle at this point is about to tell them that he's leaving. Because Paul was a church planter, and the way in which Paul did his ministry was he moved from one city to the next, planting a church, spending a couple of years discipling those people, and he moved on to the next town to do the very same thing. But what's unique about this point is Paul wants to go home. Paul wants to return to Jerusalem. And if you know anything about the book of Acts, if you know anything about the apostle Paul, you understand that at this point in Paul's life, he was a wanted man. And the crime, of course, that he was committing was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there was nowhere on earth that Paul was more wanted than the city of Jerusalem, and that wasn't a positive type of want. When he went to Jerusalem, his plan was, I want to preach the gospel to my kin. I want to preach the gospel to my ethnicity. I want to preach the gospel to my people, the Jews. And when he did that, He knew that the people at Ephesus were going to say, Paul, don't do that. That's not a good idea. 
If you go to Jerusalem, there is a better than not chance that they are going to kill you because you've broken their religious laws by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul presupposes that they're going to make this argument, and that is the basis from which Paul is making this statement. He knows what they're going to say, and so he's trying to cut them off at the pass by saying, I'm going to Jerusalem with the full realization of what's going to happen to me, and I want you to understand that safety is not my number one priority. Paul says, my life is not the greatest value. My life is not the most precious thing to me. If I go to Jerusalem and lose my life, I think it's a wise investment. Paul is making a values-based judgment by his decision to go to Jerusalem, and he uses this opportunity to teach them what it really looks like to value Jesus Christ above absolutely everything else. What Paul is stating is what he will prove is that the thing that he values the most is living the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that is is really what's supposed to be the desire of every follower of Jesus. And the question we must ask is, is that true? Is that the greatest value of my life? You know, decades ago, martyr missionary Jim Elliott commented on this very idea. And he said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain, what he cannot lose. He's making a values decision. And we'd, of course, go to give his life, taking the gospel to people who had never heard it. Many have recently and justifiably been confronted with your own mortality and the risks of living in a world cursed with pain. The question that you ask in this very important moment, is the gospel, is Jesus the most precious thing to your life? If not, do you love Jesus? Are you sure that you understand what's at stake with the gospel? Are you sure that you believe the gospel? We must day in and day out confront ourselves with those questions because what is valued is going to be revealed by the decisions that you make in your life. What do the decisions that you make in your life show that you value the most? The apostle put it this way in Philippians 3.8 when he said, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of many things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Do you see the idea there? He's saying, The most valuable thing in my life is my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is a man that knew what it meant to sacrifice for that. Paul lost a lot. Paul sacrificed greatly. Paul lost everything that we would say matters because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul literally lost his job as a Pharisee. Paul literally lost his entire career because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Paul lost his friends. Paul lost family members. Paul lost relationships that we would say, I can't give up that relationship. Paul gave it up. Paul literally gave up his safety for the gospel of Jesus Christ. From the moment that he came to faith in Jesus Christ to the moment of his death, he was a hunted man because of his faith in Jesus Christ, and because he would not shut up about it. Paul literally gave up his physical health for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He writes about it over and over again. He was stoned to the point of death. They tried to execute him. He was shipwrecked. He had even a thorn in the flesh that God would not take that many people point to and say they think it was either some type of health problem or his eyesight that he had lost. Paul knew what it meant to suffer physically for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is not a man that is writing from nowhere. This is not a man that is writing an academic treatise at this point. This is not a man that's just sharing a theory for life. This is a man who had made great sacrifice. And he says, everything that is behind me that I have lost is what people would say. But he would say, everything that I have sacrificed, 
I have no regrets. Actually, I look at them now compared to the surpassing worth of my relationship with Jesus Christ. I look at it and that word for rubbish literally means a pile of sewage. He says, that's what I think about the stuff that I've given up. It was nowhere near as valuable as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why did he do it? He then doubles down. Why? That I may gain Christ. He says, I want to live out my values. I don't want to have a faith that I talk about. I want to have a faith that I can point to because I'm living it. It wasn't that he hadn't seen other things value. He had experienced all the pleasures, and he said none of them are worth the same as Jesus. That is the attitude of Acts 20, 24. The gospel is more valuable than life itself. But number two, God wants me to finish well. See, a lot of us look at what Paul says in that first statement that my life isn't the most valuable thing, that my life isn't the most precious thing to me. And we say, you know what, five years ago, I made that same decision. You know, 10 years ago, I had a moment of discipleship where I repented of that one sin. You know, there was a time in my 20s that I really recommitted my life to Jesus. You know, there was a time in my teens, I actually came to faith in Jesus. And we always point to our growth in Christ as if it's in the rearview mirror. The apostle, in the second statement of this text, He says that the life that I value or devalue is determined by the way I finish my life, not the way that I start my life. You see, you can start well. I have started a thousand diets well. I haven't finished many of them well. Nope, nope, nope. I've lost hundreds of pounds in my life, but there they are. It's easy to start well. It's hard to finish well. The most difficult thing that you will do in your life is not have a great day of following Jesus. It's having a great lifetime of following Jesus. This is one of those moments where sports metaphors are so easily relatable to us where we talk about, you know, there's the first quarter of your life and then there's the fourth quarter of your life. I was Blessed to have been there when Dr. Falwell was in the fourth quarter of his life, and he would often tell the student body, and many times he would tell the leadership at Thomas Road, he would say, you know, I'm in the fourth quarter of my life. And this is a man that had accomplished a lot in his lifetime. In the first three quarters of his life, he'd done a lot, but he would often look to us, and he would say, I'm in the most important quarter of my life now, because he understood that how you finish is what you will be remembered for. How you finish is what you will be remembered for. A few years ago, the Atlanta Falcons were facing the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. And man, in halftime, it looked like Brady was done, didn't it? It looked like Belichick had no answer for the Atlanta Falcons. But then the second half started, and it was Brady time. And the evil empire won another one. (laughs) Everybody said, finally, Belichick is outclassed. Nope. (laughs) Why? Because the fourth quarter is more important than the first quarter. Because the second half is more important than the first half. Because the fourth quarter determines how you finish. And how you finish makes a greater statement about your life than how you started. Friends, even in ministry, I have known over the past you know, 15 years of my life, I, I've even known some of these guys who have started in ministry so well. They love Jesus. They have a vision for the church. Some of them started churches like I did. Some of them took over ministries and, and had to revitalize ministries. And then I would I had a couple of friends, man. They started a church, and within two weeks, they had three people that Sunday, 17,000 people three weeks later. And it's just like, what in the world happened? I don't know how you did that. I haven't found that secret sauce yet. But these are guys that had meteoric rises, and they were written books, and they were getting all the speaking engagements. But then there always came a day when some information was released or they were caught doing something or there was some sin that was revealed in their lives or they had mismanaged their staff in some way. And no one ever talks about the success. No one ever says, oh, but they did some great things. No. All anybody ever says about these guys is that they're failures, that they're sinners, that they blew it. 
that they didn't pastor well, that they didn't do a good job. Why? Because how you finish shows the truth about you. How your story ends tells the truth of your life. My legacy is not going to be determined by what I was like when I was 25 years old. My legacy has yet to be revealed yet. My greatest hope is to commit to what the Apostle Paul reveals here and to say, oh God, that I might finish the course that I started and order my life in such a way to give myself the greatest opportunity of success possible because I want my children to say, my father had the same passion for Jesus on the day that he died that he had the day that he came to faith in Jesus. That is my heart's desire. And here's the deal. It's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen by accident. It is only going to happen if I will set my eyes on Jesus and say, my life is is not the greatest value. It is not the most precious thing to me. The most precious thing to me is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle writes in 2 Timothy 4, 7, a few years later, he writes to his protege, understand that Paul was sitting and waiting to be executed when he wrote this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What Paul writes to Timothy in that passage is the most important thing that Paul ever wrote because what Paul is telling Timothy, I did it. I did it. I didn't embarrass Jesus. I didn't embarrass the people that I led to faith. I didn't blow it and embarrass everybody that I've discipled in my life. I kept the faith. I finished the course. Where and how you finish is going to be determined by what you value the most right now. What are you pouring your life in? What are you investing your time, your energy, your abilities, your giftings, your thoughts, your days, your months, your years, your relationships, How are you investing those things? And Paul says, here's how to do it. Number three, Jesus has given me a ministry. Jesus has given me a ministry. Note the flow. He answers rhetorical questions throughout this entire text. He says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. I want to pause there because the next two phrases are inseparable. You always have one with the other. You can never separate them out. But the first phrase is the foundation for the second phrase, the ministry that he received. Note that the Apostle Paul did not say the ministry that is based on my love language. Note that he doesn't say the ministry that is based on my availability. The ministry that is based on when I'm free. He doesn't say the ministry that is based on my spiritual gifting that I've determined I have or don't have. Paul says the ministry that I received. The secret to the apostle Paul's success is he did not base ministry on himself. He based ministry on the truth of the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's always fascinating and often kind of overlooked that Jesus, post-resurrection from his apostles, was called something different. You never saw Peter and Jesus get in a relationship where he said, oh, Lord Jesus Christ. But after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whenever they write about him, they never just say Jesus. Typically, the way that Jesus is written about is at least at minimum what the apostle says here the ministry that I received from who? The Lord Jesus. It's a statement of authority. When he says Lord, he is saying 
the design of my ministry, the definition of my ministry, and the placement of my ministry is not up to me. That is all up to the Lord Jesus because he is the boss. And so Paul is writing a statement of submission to a ministry that Jesus Christ himself would define. It is not something that he gave himself or called himself to, nor is it something that Paul could give the design to and say, here's what my ministry is going to be. Here's how it's going to be. The apostles said, this is a ministry that I have received from God himself, Jesus Christ. This is because Paul was committed to that above absolutely everything else. He risked his life for it. He endured ridicule for it. He sacrificed for it. He worked himself, according to what he writes in 1 Corinthians, Paul worked himself to the bone for the ministry that he had received from Jesus Christ. Living for Jesus was the most important thing in Paul's life, and he was willing to sacrifice everything else for it because it was that valuable to him. Now I ask you, friend, have you ever had something in your life that you wanted so bad that you were willing to make great sacrifice for? See, I think the lie that we tell ourselves is that sacrifice isn't something that we do very often. Sacrifice, it's just so difficult that I don't do it very often. No, your entire life has been spent sacrificing. You wake up every day and you make a sacrifice for something. It's just that you sacrifice for what is the most valuable thing to you, and then sometimes you lie to yourself and you act like you didn't sacrifice. When I was 16 years old, I'm just going to use my lifeline as an example. When I was 16 years old, do you know what was the most valuable thing in the world to me? Getting a car. I didn't care what kind of car it was. I didn't care what the paint scheme. I don't care if it matched. It'd be a green hood with turquoise fenders. I didn't care. But I wanted a car, so I sacrificed for it. I got a part-time job. I was working nights. I was working weekends. I wasn't buying, you know, the CDs that I wanted. That's what they were called back then, kids. I, you know, I, I, I said, no, I'm not going to wear guest jeans because, you know, I was, I was pretty hoity-toity back in the day. I was like, maybe I won't buy those guest jeans this weekend, you know. Uh, maybe I won't wear Sperry's. Maybe I'll wear Harry's, you know, the off-brand. And, and, and so I sacrificed so that I could get a car. Then when, it, when I turned 17, I sacrificed so I could get a girl. All right, I was like, that's the most important thing. You're 17 years old. The most important thing to you is either you want a boyfriend or you want a girlfriend. I was willing to put any type of experimental cream on my face, even if it was going to burn an entire layer of skin off if it would get rid of the acne. All right, I was like, because I want a girl and she don't like acne. All right, and I need gas to have a girl to fill my car up. So I got to keep working my job. I was making sacrifices. Then from 18 to 21, I sacrificed to get an education. I pulled so many all-nighters, it was crazy because I wanted to get a degree. It was worth the sacrifice to me. Then when I graduated, guess what? I wanted to get married, and somehow I conned the woman of my dreams in, into believing I was somebody that she may or may not have been conned into believing I was, and then she married me, and somehow 15 years later, she's still here. Whew, it's the con of a lifetime. And it's taking me a lifetime. Uh, oh, no, she's here. Uh, but so I sacrificed because I wanted her to be my wife. Yeah, to buy a ring and stuff. How come she didn't have to buy me a ring? When you're older, you start asking these questions. Why did I have to buy a ring? She didn't give me a gift. All right, but I digress. Go on, she gave me the gift of her life. Whatever. There's no monetary value there. Cut that, by the way. <laughs> then I sacrificed so I could buy a house. Then I sacrificed so I could have a career. Then I sacrificed for my children. And I'm still sacrificing for my children. I'm still sacrificing for a career. I'm still sacrificing to put food on the table and be a responsible adult. So don't believe this lie that you don't know how to sacrifice. Every moment of every day is some form of sacrifice. The truth is you're sacrificing for what you really value. The question, again, do you value the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because so often our sacrifice is for things that benefit us and nobody else because it's a faulty value system that the temporary things of this world are worth more than the gospel of Jesus. 
But don't get it wrong. It is a peculiar ministry that God has called you to. It's fascinating when I think about the Apostle Paul. I don't think about the language that he actually uses in this text because the language that Paul actually uses in this text is fascinating because he says, I've received a ministry. Now that sounds good, but that word is actually diakonos, which is the same word that we use for deacon. But it's a word that in this form, in its simplest understanding, just means servant. And what Paul is saying is, in the literal language, I have received servanthood from the Lord Jesus. Now, when I think about Paul, I think, pretty important guy. This is the apostle to the Gentiles. This is the greatest church planter that ever lived. This is a guy that scholars point to and say he wrote at least half of the New Testament. That's a pretty important person. But the secret sauce of how Paul was going to endure in finishing the course and how he was going to continue to say, my life is not the most valuable thing, nor is it the most precious thing to me, is because the posture that Paul took was not, Jesus, you are lucky to have someone as gifted as me, and I'm going to show you how valuable I am. No, it was a man who took a posture and said, the greatest thing that could ever happen in my life and the greatest thing that has happened in my life is the honor of being called a servant of the Lord Jesus. Paul saw himself as a servant. He took the posture of a servant, and he understood that this was the greatest calling that anyone could ever have in life. But number four, that which is inseparable from this, the purpose of my life is to tell people about Jesus. The purpose of my life is to tell people about Jesus. Note how he finishes the text. If only I may finish the course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. But then he explains that ministry. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The life of a Christian is a life of someone living in submission to the rule of Jesus. Therefore, we have to define servanthood the way that Jesus defines servanthood, and most of us struggle with that definition. Because for many of us, we define servanthood based on how we feel about how we're serving another person, we don't start with a foundation of who God is. But when you think about the good news of Jesus Christ, you think, man, that is good news because news is pointing to another person. Only if you're a follower of Jesus because you're going to serve something with your life and you only ultimately have two options. You can either serve sin and with sin, you get shame, guilt, condemnation, and eternal separation from God, or you serve Jesus who's paid the penalty for my sin, to remove the shame, to remove the guilt, to reconcile my relationship with God, and that gives me eternal joy in God. Sometimes, though, we get lost in defining what it means to serve. For the past 15 years of my life, this is probably the greatest argument that I've had with so many people in the church of Jesus Christ. It's a non-ending argument, not with one person, with about 3,000 people I've had this conversation. But I don't feel like that is serving. Well, Jesus really didn't ask what you feel like. But where I feel like I'm valued the most, well, Jesus isn't that interested in where you feel the most valued the most. Well, but that's not my gift. Jesus isn't that interested, quite frankly, with what you feel gifted in and what you don't feel gifted in. The utmost of learning what it means to serve Jesus Christ is to remember who sets the standard. We have to define service around what Jesus calls us toward, and we cannot define service around our giftings, around our preferences, around our desires. So oftentimes we will serve so long as it makes us feel good and it makes us feel needed. But the fact of the matter is, you don't get to define that. Only Jesus gets to define that. So we typically define service around something that we can do for others. Now, don't misunderstand me. Serving often orients itself around doing things for other people. But Paul defines the service specifically here. The ministry that Paul received was about telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. So in all the ways that we serve, we must not forget, as often we do, that Christian service 
is always about pointing people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So for the Christian, if you don't get to pointing people to Jesus Christ, you have served them in a sense, but you have not served them in the Christian sense. And so the normal conversation that I will have about service is that people will come and they say, I want to serve where I feel the best. I say, well, you need to feel really good about changing your opinion. You need to change your feelings. Well, I want to serve where I'm needed because where I'm serving right now, I don't feel needed. You know what that tells me? That your service is oriented around you. This is not about where you're needed because Jesus is not concerned with where you feel needed. Jesus is concerned with what he's told you to do. Jesus wants you to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Well, that's hard. I know. Well, I don't feel great all the time when I do that. I mostly just feel like I'm going to throw up. I know. How do you think I feel on Sundays? You have to orient your life and how you define servicehood around how Jesus Christ himself defines servicehood, because it is a peculiar service. It's peculiar, because we have to ask a very important question. How is telling people something serving them? How? Here's how the apostle put it, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, and I think about just that phrase. I don't have time to, to break it down all the way. But what he's saying is, because of the gospel, when you believe it, you've been approved by God. Think about how amazing that is. When God looks at me, because of my faith in Jesus, he approves of me. There's no greater joy than knowing that the God of the universe approves of me. But then secondly, he says, once you've been approved by God, he immediately entrusts you with something. And you say, wait a second, I didn't know about that. You're entrusted with the message of the very thing that you get approval by God for. And then look at the outcome. The apostle tells us why grammar is so important in the New Testament. What do you do with what you've been entrusted with? So we speak. So many of you are doing everything that you can to build the life of serving God so long as you don't have to open your mouth and tell someone about it. And you are avoiding the very action that defines Christian servanthood, telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why our ministry is so peculiar. That's why so many people don't often understand it. And that is also why the world didn't look at Paul and say, Paul, thank you so much for serving us. No, they chopped his head off. Because Paul understood what values are really about. It's good news to be told because the work has already been done. Friends, I tell you, I want my vision for the next season of my life to be obsessed with valuing Jesus. I want to be obsessed with finishing well. I want to be obsessed with glorying in the ministry that Jesus has given me, and I want to prove it by telling it to as many people as possible and pointing them to all that Jesus has done for me. So what do you need to do? I'm going to give you four things quickly. First, Admit what you value more than Jesus. And I know that the, the devotional thing to say right here is nothing. He's the most important thing. Don't lie to yourself. Every morning of my life, I have to confront myself with this. I have to ask myself, what am I going to be tempted today to value more than I value Jesus? Secondly, once you figure it out, repent. And then keep repenting. So many times, so many Christians fail Because you treat repentance as that one thing you did that one time a long time ago. Repentance is an everyday activity, and it is the only way you're ever going to grow in your faith. Number three, find a way to commit to serving Jesus. And this is where all of those, uh, you know, excuses come up in our head, but I've got this commitment, I've got that commitment, I don't have time for discipleship, I don't have time for community, I don't have time to be in the Word, I don't have time to be in prayer. All right, if that's what happens in your mind whenever somebody says, find a way to commit to serving Jesus, return to number one. And then start repenting all over again. 
And then number four, tell people about Jesus. Tell people the gospel. Speak it into the lives of everyone around you. Because if you're living out steps one through three, not only do you have a great message to give people, but you have a life in which you are proving that you believe that message. Every Sunday, we reflect on our time in the Word through communion, and either on the seat uh, beside you or in the seat back in front of you, there should be a wonderfully hygienic um, communion uh, set, prepackaged. When you open the top of it, there's the bread, which represents the broken body of Christ. And then when you open the bottom of it, there's the cup that represents his shed blood. And when you eat and when you drink, you proclaim to everyone in this room, I believe the gospel of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I just want to caution you that if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, please don't eat or drink because I don't want you to feel like you have to lie to us this morning. I want you to feel like you can be honest. I want you to know you can be saved. I want you to know you can be a Christian. If you'll just turn from your sin, trust in Jesus Christ. He will save you from your sin. But if you are a Christian, friends, eat, drink, proclaim your faith to everyone in this room, and then we'll stand and we'll sing.